We're live on Spiritual Psychics TV with Paul Bannister and his guests for Spiritual Talk. Hi everybody and welcome to Spiritual Talk here on our home in Spiritual Psychics TV. Welcome, it's six o'clock on a Thursday evening and where else would you want to be on a Thursday evening? Please come and say hello to us, let us know you're joining and also where you're joining in from. Tonight, though, guys, we've got a brilliant guest. And this remember, these interviews are an interactive experience. So please don't be afraid to ask questions. And our guest tonight has so much experience with not just mediumship, but also she's had her own near-death experiences. So um, just let me know you're there, guys. I've got my screen up. I can't see any comments yet. We always go into Facebook and YouTube. So it We'd love you to share as well, because some of the information coming out tonight, hopefully, is educational and you'll really enjoy the evening. And we've got Christine. Hi, Christine. She comes in from Arizona. Hello, Christine. Fantastic. Which is where our guest coming in from tonight. Elizabeth Jones. Hello and hi from South Wales. And uh, Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Uh, Joanne, the croaking shaman. Good evening and hope you are well. Hi, Joe. And Carrie Ann, hi Carrie, she's coming in from Ontario, Canada. This is truly an international experience. This is fantastic. Hi guys, hi Kim, good afternoon. She's coming in from the US. Great to see you, Kim. Thank you for joining us. And Millie Brown, yeah, we're good, we're all good. And I'm, I'm just super excited and I can't wait to go. Maria Williams, good evening and hello. Hello, she's coming in from Staffordshire. Wonderful Staffordshire. And Tina. Hi, Tina. She's coming in from Southampton. Sunny Southampton. And oh, hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. I believe you're based in New York, Michael. So good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Hi, and hi, and Joanne Lewis. She's coming in from Birmingham. Hi, Joe. Love to know what that sign was, Joe, because that flashed up really quickly. But hi, Eva. Uh, Sweden says hi to everyone. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And Linda. Hi, Linda. She's put hi, Paul. And we've also got Richard in the background, guys. We can't forget Richard. Richard is the glue that binds it all together. He is the man behind the scenes, getting all the programs together. He's up first thing in the morning, goes to bed last thing at night. Have I just had my brownie points there, Richard? I'm not sure. Thank you very much. And Wendy, Wendy, good day from Australia. We are really global now. It's fantastic. Hi, Wendy. It's good to join us. And Deb Clark as well. Hi, Deb. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Joe. Oh, and she's put Sir Richard. I think someone could be in for a, a New Year's Honours list, Richard. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if, if King Charles um, has seen our programmes yet. Is he a good mate of yours? That's really good. We'll, we'll put in a good word. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And Yes, we do. And Rebecca, just quick, lastly, last, our last hello is Rebecca coming in from Leicestershire. Guys, thank you for joining us tonight because tonight I'm so excited. Our guest is coming all the way in from Arizona. This lady is amazing. She has appeared on so many different podcasts, which myself I saw on um, Next Level Soul, this interview, and I was so excited. I just had to be cheeky and ask if I could get this lady on, and she said yes. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have Dr. Lottie Valentine, and Dr. Lottie is an evidential medium. She is a a psychic medium. She's an ancestral healer. Healer? Where did that come from? Healer, medical medium, which in in itself is uh, so fascinating, but also an international keynote speaker, but also a survivor of a near-death experience, but not just one. I believe you had two. And hello, Lottie. Thank you for joining us. Hey, hello. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to have Dr. Lottie Valentine on this show. Thank you for coming on. And, uh, well, the first question we'd like to know, we want to go way back. We kind of want to get to know your background because you're a doctor, you're a medium, you're a near-death survivor, experience survivor, you know, there's so much in there. Can, can you please go back to the beginning of how it started? How it started with a near-death experience, or mm, yeah, well, well, can you give us a little bit for, of background about you and who you are as a person? Because I believe you was an atheist as well. 
right? So I was actually born and raised in uh, Sweden in northern Scandinavia. And when I was 21, I married an American, and that's how I ended up in the United States. Okay. But growing up, um, I was an atheist. I I did go to uh, confirmation camp when I was 14. And in Sweden, back then, the state and the church uh, wasn't separated yet. So when you were born, you were automatically a Lutheran, and the church was what did all the bookkeeping. So when you needed a passport, you actually went to the church as a child. So I was confirmed when I was 14, and I thought, this is just ridiculous. Like, who would believe in all of this? Uh, When you die, that's it. It's black. You're gone. And I had no beliefs whatsoever in the afterlife, spirit world, uh, angels, or anything like that. And then I moved to the United States when I was 21. And I transferred into uh, Boston University from Stockholm's University. And then I actually worked as a programmer and systems analyst uh, in my youth uh, in uh, Westchester County, New York. And talk about being (laughs) systematic and (laughs) A to B to C to D, right, when you're uh, programming. And then um, I started having children and I took a leave of absence. And then uh, I had another child and then I had another child. And by the time I had my third child, uh, it was in 1992. And... My second child, I, I believe I only had like three or four contractions. That child came up very fast. Wow. And wow. I, have, we had, I had one contraction, went to the hospital, had another one, had another one on the table, and the fourth one, he came out. So with this third child, I said, we have to go right now because what if this child comes as quickly as the second yeah. one? So we headed to the hospital uh, probably at you know, two or three in the morning. And then as I'm contracting about three minutes apart, we have a 7.4 earthquake and this was one of the one of the it's actually one of the largest earthquakes the reason we don't hear that much about it is because it was centered in the desert so that so the destruction right. wasn't that bad but okay. i was in the hospital <laughs> i was in the eastern part of anaheim so yeah. for people who are familiar with disneyland in california that's in anaheim this was in the eastern part so it was kind of bordering almost like the, the at the edge before the desert and this was a new hospital that was built on rollers. So when that earthquake hit, the entire hospital just rolled from side wow. to side. And looking at those windows, it was a pretty new hospital and it had those, you know, floor to ceiling kind of windows. And literally my husband, the midwife, the nurses were leaning over me on the birthing table so that I would not fly off. It yeah. was that. And wow. at that moment... It was, you know, it was one of the moments in my life when I thought I was going to die. And I think a lot of people can uh, relate to this because you've been close to a car accident. You have, it's like your life flashes before your eyes. You're thinking, oh my God, this is it. And then you get out of it, right? And so I had that experience. We lost the power in the hospital and the generators kicked on and it was like a night light. You know, if you have a night light in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. And then my labor actually stopped because the threat of death was so close, right? I thought I was going to die. Yeah. So my labor stopped. And then it picked back up uh, half an hour, 45 minutes later. And I gave birth to my daughter. Then as soon as they were going to give me the baby, I just leaned backwards and I just screamed. I was, they had just given me the baby and I yelled to my husband, take the baby, take the baby. And I was in excruciating pain. And they took the baby and then I hemorrhaged. So that was the first time I hemorrhaged. And they massaged my uterus. And this, you know, a little mountain of blood clots came out. They put me on Pitocin drip and to contract the uterus back down to squeeze out what was there. You know, in a normal situation, would they have done a DNC? Maybe gone in and scraped out the uterus. But we... We were running a hospital on a generator. They were concerned about people who were on life support and things like that, making yeah. sure that nobody was going to die in this process. Yeah. So um, 24 to 48 hours later, I had to stay an extra day. They sent me home. And then as time went by, I had this excruciating pain uh, that was, it, it was like, imagine, uh, you know, swallowing a bowling ball. And at the, at the, at, in your pelvis, you, you okay. feel like you're carrying a bowling ball and it's just this pressure and it just really hurt it would hurt so much i would have to sit down 
I was thinking, wow, I mean, this is my third, you know, natural birth. Yeah. It's kind of weird that I have so much pain. I couldn't figure out what it was. I didn't have a fever or, or anything. And it was um, 10 days later. It was July 10th. My friends were having a baby shower for me in the park. And I went to the baby shower. I brought my kids. My boys were six and three and a half and the newborn baby. My parents were visiting from Sweden to help with the birth yeah. and take care of the kids. And I said, wow, I really feel like I have to use the restroom. So I went to the, the restroom in the park and this huge blood clot came out. It was oh. like the size of a, of a baby's head. I mean, it was enormous. Wow. And I went back to my friend and I said, something is really wrong. Like I had this huge blood clot come out. Threw the kids back in the car, drove home. My husband came home from work, took me to the ER. So here we are in the ER. They do a manual inspection. They say, well, it doesn't seem like there's you know, too much bleeding now. It seems pretty normal. Yeah. Um, it could have been a second lining. We'll keep you for observation for a little bit. And that was it. There was no blood work, no ultrasound. It was just a manual visual exam. So after two or three hours, they sent me back home. So the next day in the evening, probably around like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the evening, I go to the use the restroom, another large blood clot comes out. Oh. So I yelled to my parents and my husband. I said, you know, hey, I'm bleeding again. Yeah. So I lie down on the bed. My husband calls the hospital. And I say, I'm not going back to the hospital. It's going to be pointless because they're, they're not going to do anything because they didn't do anything yesterday. Yeah. So it was decided I should see the doctor next morning in Huntington Beach, California, where we lived at the time. Yeah. So the next morning, now it's Friday morning, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning, I go to see the OBGYN, same thing. Okay, what happened? I had, I had these two large blood clots. Well, it doesn't seem like there's much happening now. It's just a trickle of blood. Yeah. And, you know, go back home. So in the uh, late afternoon, around 4 or 5 o'clock, I used the restroom. Another blood clot comes out. So I yelled to my husband and my parents, and we said, okay, well, this is the third time. This, we can't yeah. keep going like this. Yeah. So we went back to the ER. So here I am in the ER again, and another manual inspection. And they say, well, it could have been, you know, two linings coming out. We'll keep you for observation. Nothing, nothing is done. And they leave me there. I don't have a bell to ring. They close the door, and I'm just lying in the ER. So eventually I start bleeding again. And oh. at this point, it wasn't one of those huge blood clots. It was just some bleeding. And I didn't think much of it because by now I'm used to having this huge clots come out. Yeah. So I'm just lying there and a nurse comes to check on me. She opens the door and her jaw just drop. And I can see the fear on this woman's face. And I hear the call on the loudspeaker, OBGYN, stat to the ER, OBGYN, stat to the ER. And all I'm thinking is, oh, thank God, they finally figured out something is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just lying there. She cleans up the paper, you know, and cleans everything up. And this middle-aged physician comes literally running full speed into the ER with a younger physician in tow, probably a resident physician. Again, they do a manual inspection. He says quickly, well, you know, what's going on? So I told him, I said, I've been bleeding since Wednesday. You know, this is now the fourth time I'm having yeah. all this bleeding. So again, they do a manual inspection. And while they do the manual inspection, one of those large blood clots comes out. Oh. And at that point, I try to sit up. So now I've been bleeding. You know, this is the fifth time I'm bleeding in three days. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to sit up and I tell, say, I don't feel too good. And, of course, you know, this doctor has probably been through uh, things in his life because he looked like he was in his late 50s, maybe early 60s. Okay. So he knew exactly what was going on. So he just pushed me down on the table and the room started filling with people. My eyes are now closed. Yeah. And uh, I can hear they're tipping the table backwards. So my head is going towards the floor. My feet yeah. are going up in the air. They're trying to keep the little blood I had left in my brain and heart. And I have a nurse on my right that's coding my blood pressure. And I have a nurse on my left trying to place an IV. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what's taking this nurse so long? But now I know that, you know, once you go into shock and once you start collapsing, your veins uh, also collapse. And it's really yeah. hard to get an IV. And so she's struggling yeah. trying to get it in. And I hear the nurse on the right and she yells out, 50 over 15, hurry. And I'm... 
at that point, it's like, I'm, you know, imagine jumping out of an airplane without a parachute and you just free fall. And that's probably my blood pressure, you know, plummeting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just feel like I'm falling through the air. And it's at shortly after she yells out 50 over 15. I mean, that's like you're below supporting a heartbeat now. And yeah. it's shortly after she yells that, that I know that I'm dying. And that is very different from that experience I had when I was giving birth, yeah. when I thought I was going to die, die. This time I knew I was dying. It was very different. Okay. And all I could do at that point was, you know, I just pray that I was going to survive. So what do I do? The atheist that I am, I don't believe in anything, but at this point there's nothing left. And so I say, I pray to God to save my life. And I say, please let me live. I have three yeah. children under the age of six. They need a mother. Yeah. And it was shortly after that, I was just pulled out of my body. And I find myself floating maybe, you know, three to five feet outside my body. Yeah. But when I'm outside, I know there is no time. There's some, you know, the second experience I have that we were talking about, it's very different from the first one. But the, this first one, I knew that was no time on the other side. Time didn't exist like it does for us in this realm. Yeah. There is no time. I knew I had access to past, present, and future all at the same time. Wow. It was like time was time is meaningless. But yeah. there's also that feeling of unconditional love and safety, and you're completely fine. And I'm while well, that's my body down there, that's where I live. I live in that body. That's my it's like you live in your house, right? That's my house when you're coming home. And you go inside. That's what it was like. The soul was just outside. But I knew I belonged to that body down there. Yeah. And shortly after that, I got sucked back in. And it's it happens so quickly. There are no words for me to use to describe because it's a split millisecond of you're outside and then you're back inside. Yeah. And and then um, I struggled with my health for, for a long time. And do you want me to go straight into the second NDE or do you have any questions along the way? Well, it's, uh, I mean, the first thing that comes into my mind is that being present or, or, or having this understanding about their having access to the past, present and future. So being in the moment, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is that what? Yeah, there is no, yeah, there is, um, there is no time. So I don't know if when you work, you know, as a medium or get messages from the spirit world and you know that something is coming, but sometimes, sometimes you can get a timeline, but sometimes it's just, oh, this is, you know, you're going to be doing this next. I'm like, when is it three months from now, six yeah. months from now or five years from now? And it's like, time seems so irrelevant sometimes when you get messages. So sometimes there is, I, I get that because time is, it's like, it's not important yeah. on the other side. There is no time there. It's just for us to have that experience when we live in this dimension yeah. because our bodies are aging and it's, we have this timeline. But when you're outside your body, there is no time the way yeah. we experience time. I'm sorry. There's so many questions around that as well. And I'll come back to that after we talk about your, your next experience. But Chris is hard. Chris, she's asked, is there an approximate number or, or on how many past lives? Is that something you're aware of at that moment that you've had this many incarnations or, uh, not at that moment, but it's something that I have experienced along the way. And uh, I have remembered some of my past lives. Um, oh, wow. I spoke uh, about it at um, the IONS conference. Um, but we can talk about that later. The, yeah, I actually had, went and verified uh, the information I was receiving in a meditation. Wow. And it was absolutely true. <laughs> and I had no idea. It was it, you just literally guided to the information. Yeah. Uh, and it's a fun it's a fun story so we can get to that yeah please. Uh, later. absolutely so so can we go to the next experience i'm mm -hmm. sorry to i've got so many questions yeah so, so, so the next you're right so the next experience <laughs> is so different from the first and i always joke that they saved me too quickly i didn't get the full effect during the okay. first one so i had to have i had to have a second experience to really put me on my life path so i really struggled with with this experience and because I didn't have that belief and my father was a physician as well. And he said, no, 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 they can't happen. You can't, it, you know, he was an atheist. He had grown up going to Sunday school, which is just interesting, but he still didn't have any belief in the afterlife. Okay. And 
I struggled, you know, with what what was what was it then? Because it was it was more real than life itself. It was so real, the experience itself. And it was actually my mother-in-law, who I called my earthly spirit guide, who guided me uh, on this journey. And she, after my parents went home, um, because I was so sick afterwards, because I lost yeah. so much blood, and I developed something called um, like a bone marrow suppression. So I didn't have enough right. white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets. Okay. So I had all these bruises, and I was a, I was a mess, and I would keep getting pneumonia, and my immune system wow. wasn't functioning. And you can get something like that from just being pregnant. It's called idiopathic aplastic anemia, and it's right. a suppression of the bone marrow. And so here I am. So I had been pregnant, and then I also um, almost lost my life. So there was a lot of um, electrical interference. My watches would stop, and um, I would... So this all happened before my second NDE, but okay. I, I literally sat in a rocking chair for six months because I was too sick um, to even leave the house. And then I started walking uh, one house to the left, one house to the right uh, to, to start trying to build up my strength. And then I started bruising and I had this huge bruise that spanned my entire hip. I bumped into the baby's changing table, something that would give you a bruise the size of, of like a small coin. Yeah. For a normal person, it, I had a bruise that was purple and red uh -huh. across my entire hip. And it was May. And we lived, so it's all, it's 11 months after my ND. You know, my daughter was born in June. And I'm getting pneumonia. And we live in Huntington Beach, California. Who do, who gets pneumonia in May? Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Maybe like December, January, flu season. Yeah. So I... And we, I also had pneumonia in during Christmas. Everybody got sick with the flu, and every the whole family was given antibiotics. And I got sicker after eight days on antibiotics. I had to go back to the walk. We actually had to go to a walk-in clinic because my husband had taken a new job. And here in the United States, if you can't pay the hundreds of dollars of Cobra payment for interim insurance, yeah. so we just said, okay, well we can't afford that for the whole family with three kids. So we're just gonna. Wait, and I told you know my husband. I said, "Don't don't worry about it. I'm getting better. It, it's a slow healing process, but we don't need the hospital that almost lost my life. You know, yeah. almost killed me. Yeah. So yeah. we didn't want to you know pay all that money for that kind of uh, service either. So we all went to the walk-in clinic. I got sicker. I went back after eight days, and they said, "You are you are you are so sick." And um, they did a blood test right there, and they came back in the room and said. Do you have AIDS or leukemia? Because you have no, you have no white blood cells. You have no immune system. And I said, well, I hope I don't have either of it. I, I never took the blood transfusion, um, and so that's why I was. It took. It was such a slow healing process because yeah. back then in 1992, it was when a lot of the blood was contaminated with AIDS, and we didn't right. have a testing process. So. We decided to go on the safer side and not risk that. And so it was a, took me a longer time to build up that blood again. And But by Christmas, my whole system was going haywire. And I apparently didn't even have any immune system at all. And they said, you had to go to the ER because you're too sick. And I said, I don't have any insurance. I'm not going to the ER. And also, I was traumatized from that experience. And I yeah. didn't trust in the doctors. So anyway, they gave me another antibiotics. They gave me they gave me injections, and I had to stay in the walk-in clinic for two or three hours. And then it said, "All right, we're going to send you home, but if you get worse, you have to go to the ER." Yeah. So I finally managed to recover for that. And then in um, in the spring, I started having all this bruising. But in the meantime, it was March. So my daughter was born in June. So it's nine months later. My watch had died like that first week, you know, that I was sitting up after after my near-death experience and i figured yeah. it was just a battery or an old watch so i was finally strong enough after nine months to go to a uh, target which is like um a store that has clothes and all different kinds of uh things for your for your home and as soon as you walk in the door there's the watch department so i didn't have to walk very far got in got a watch brought it home wore it for a few days and it stopped so i said oh, wow thanks. this is so weird so it was such an effort too to go to the store because I had I was so weak. Yeah. yeah. And so a week later I make the same effort. I go back with a watch and I said, Hey, it stopped and um I don't know why. And they said, Wow, that's so strange. Well I'll go pick another watch. So I picked the same watch again. Wore it for a week and it stopped. So I said, Wow, this is really weird. 
it must be poor quality mm-hmm. control. So I bring again, make this huge effort, go back to the store. And they said, wow, this is this is really strange. We haven't gotten any other watches back. Yeah. I asked, wow, this is weird. I'm going to get I'll, I'll get a different brand this time. So I got a different brand watch Wore it for a week. It stopped. Yeah. So then my best friend looks at me and she just laughs and she goes, honey, it's not the watch. It's you. You're the one that's doing this. So I was like, what do you mean? It's me. Well, a month later, um, we are, uh, my kids are playing outside with the other kids in this little courtyard and I walk by the television and it turns on and I'm looking at the table. I was like the kids, you know, my, my oldest son is seven. They're playing a prank on me or something. So I look, no, the TV clicker is right there on the table. I go outside. I said, okay, well, that's really weird. So I turn it off. I walk by the TV again, turns back on. <laughs> so I'm like, hmm, this is very strange. So I, I go and knock on my, all my neighbor's doors. I said, do you have a television with this kind of a clicker? And you accidentally pointed it through the window and then it went in my window and maybe turned on my television. No, n- nobody was watching TV. It was you know, like 10 o'clock in the morning. So I said, wow, that's really weird. So that's how the things began. Okay. And then... Um, so and then two years later, so now I'm really sick. So now we're going to the but people can get an idea. So during this whole time, it was as if my soul didn't merge back with my body. Imagine okay. laying a, a, a puzzle and then you're putting the last puzzle piece into the puzzle, but it's sticking up. And so you have to pad it to make it be flat with the puzzle. That's what it was like. So it was like I'm the, I have this puzzle piece, which is my soul, and it just constantly tries to leave or comes out of my body and I'm okay. constantly struggling to to keep my soul like, no nope, we're not leaving come back soul and I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would pull my legs up take my head off the pillow we're well, no, we're not leaving we're, we're staying here and that was just my life um for the first couple of years afterwards because I was struggling with this bone marrow suppression so I didn't have enough blood in my body I was literally walking if now when I think back after I have gone to medical school I'm like I don't know how I survived that because you know it's it's such a that's a very scary I mean I could have fallen down I could have bled to death any moment because I was yeah. bruising so easily I didn't have any platelets I didn't have enough yeah. red blood cells so here I am in the middle of the night and I struggled with this for a long time is should I call this another near death experience or should I call this a spiritually transformative experience an STE because okay. I was so worried for a long time. I can't prove that I was close to death. It's happening in the middle of the night. I don't have like the medical records that say, yeah. but now after all these years, you know, this is 20, uh, 31 and 29 years ago. And when I wrote my book uh, in that process of, of healing all this, I realized it really doesn't matter what you call it because it is what happens afterwards from these experiences. It doesn't matter what name you give it. You had yeah. some form of a spiritual experience and that, that is really all that matters and how then that changed you in the end. So here I am in the middle of the night and again, I wake up and my, you know, so lightheaded and I take my head off the pillow and then same thing as the, the ER, one second I'm inside, the next second I'm just outside. But the second experience is very different because I'm, I'm literally, it's almost like a Star Wars movie. I'm, it's like I'm flying through space itself. I'm just tumbling through darkness, through space itself. And then I get to what I call the mid station because it's like you're going into an elevator that has, or a skyscraper that has a hundred floors and you push the button on the 50th floor and you get off on the 50th floor and you say, well, you're aware that you got, you know, 49 or 50 floors above you and you got all these floors below you because it's your awareness and it was like that. So I call it the mid station because I was aware of levels. There were levels below me and levels above me and I don't exactly know what that is, but that was the awareness. And then I hear the most beautiful music you can imagine. You can't make this music on the earth plane because I tried, I tried for days. We had this Roland synthesizer that had probably 200 sounds, could not find any sound that had that beautiful, that beautiful music. Um, and as I'm hearing this music, I look to the right and I see a little log cabin. And I think it's so funny what we see. 
I see a little log cabin, almost like a sauna, like a Swedish sauna, yeah. like a little log cabin. And I open the door and I'm thinking the music must be coming from there. So open the door, look inside, but it's empty. So then I look to the left. I see this, the mirror image of the log cabin on the right. And I open the door, I look inside, but it's empty. So, but then as I'm in this, you know, perplexed, I'm like, where's this music coming from? I become aware of this very bright white light behind me. So as I'm turning around, but I'm only in spirit form to my awareness, I don't remember seeing like a body or anything. It's just I'm this, this spirit form. But then this white, this bright white light is like, imagine a, a dense white fog that yeah. you're now shining a car dealership spotlight through. Trying to, but it's this very bright white light, but it's everywhere and it's sort of enveloping everything and you so you are in this light you're a part of this light but in the in this light there is an outline of angels in this light wow. and the music is coming from the angels i don't believe in angels but this is what i'm seeing right so yeah. i'm completely aware of the fact that i don't believe in angels but i am seeing angels and this beautiful music is coming from the angels but this light the light is is source it's the divine source itself um you can call it whatever you want you can call it god you can call it whatever it doesn't matter what name you give it because that just puts a, a religious stamp on it and that is what we are living with here in this dimension yeah. all the different religions and we call this divine source god or whatever we want to call it uh but that is divine source but we are part of that light yeah. And we return to that light. And it's just pure, unconditional love. And we carry that light within us. We are part of that light. Yeah. And as I'm in, being enveloped of this unconditional love and light and with this uh, most beautiful music you can imagine, I become aware of two spirit guides. And the one on the right says to the other one, watch the other guide, what is she doing here? She can't be here. She has to go back. Wow. And I say... No, no, no. Wait a second. <laughs> How can I be outside my body and still be me? Because I had been struggling now for two years with this first experience thinking, yeah. I don't, I mean, maybe it is some kind of crazy hallucination. I don't know. You know, I didn't, you know, I read the life after life, Raymond Moody, yeah. and I was yeah. trying to put everything into context, but I was such a scientist and I had such you know, disbelief in the spirit world at that time. So even that experience, I was still having doubt, right? So the spirit guide says, she has to go back. And I said, wait a second, how can this be? How can I be outside my body and still be me? Yeah. And the spirit guide on the on diagonally sort of to the left in front of me says, well, if I told you, you won't remember, but you will remember this. So I would say, and I've heard this later from other people, there is some kind of mechanism where, they can they get to control, forget. yeah, to remember, yeah. right? Some some magic over there. Yeah. And then it's like I'm standing on the moon looking down on the earth because then all of a sudden it's just, this image appears. And I see the earth, but around the earth there is this, what I call the silvery glittery fishnet because a fishnet is kind of diamond shape. And so this is in 1994 before we had the internet or we could Google yeah. grid around the earth and yeah. all those things. Yeah. And I see this glitter on the earth and I call it the silvery glittery fishnet because in Sweden I rode the I rode the little boat from my grandmother and she would lay fishnets in the ocean to catch fish. And when she lifted them out, out of the ocean in the early morning sun, the water droplets would sparkle on the fishnet. Beautiful. So I'm trying to make sense of what it is that I'm seeing, right? So to yeah. me it was I called it the sparkling glittery fishnet because it was yeah. the grid around the earth. And then the spirit guide says, everything on earth is connected to each other, but everything on earth is connected up to this grid. Right. And with that information, I got sent back. So that was in 1994. And literally my whole life, it's literally what activated my life path. And that's why I always joke that I didn't get the full effect of the first experience. They needed to get this information to me so that I could activate my life path because that is literally my work today as a physician, as a medium, as an ancestral healer, and the understanding of how we are actually connected uh, via quantum physics, 
or you know people who are familiar with Indra's net, uh, it's like a, a spider web. It's like literally the grid. We are all connected to each other. We're connected via DNA to each other, uh, if it's our parents or family, but we're also connected via quantum physics, right? Anybody that we meet and that energy, now we're entangled with that energy. Yeah. So now, it is can what I, can activated. Can I just stop you there? Yeah. Because Chris just made a comment um, on the last comment, Richard. I don't know if you can see it where she said she'd, she'd noticed that a lot of people that had had near-death experiences have also come back with mediumistic abilities. Had you realized at the time after this experience, how quick did that come through that you was aware? There you go, Chris. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it's interesting that quite a few people have gone on to become mediums after they've had this yeah. profound experience. There's no other way to call that. And then the next lady, I missed your name. So sorry, Richard's going to put the comment up. Also recognized that, uh, I don't know if you can see that one, Richard, the other oh, get from Kim. The last few days before my mother-in-law passed, she told me she was hearing the most beautiful music. And I've heard that as well. The music of the spheres, the music of um the angels absolutely i've heard it i've uh, i've heard it been said but i've never been blessed to hear it so we look forward to that um so in terms of your mediumistic ability when did that start to unfold because that's a because you yeah, yes. from an atheist to hit oh my God, yes. you've got all these questions your mind must be hurting at this point and they're yeah. really challenging your belief system yeah so it started actually the day after my first near-death experience in the hospital and as i was lying in the bed in the hospital you know hooked up to all these different monitors um, my head was just pounding um because i had so little blood in my system my hands and ha my hands and feet were ice cold um and as i'm lying in this hospital bed uh contemplating on you know what happened the day before I become aware of my sister-in-law in the left corner of the ceiling in the hospital room. And she had just passed away um, like about two weeks earlier. And she was only in her 40s. And she passed away from cancer. And as I'm lying in this bed, I become aware of her, that she's in the left corner of my ceiling. And she says, everything's going to be okay. And again, I'm thinking, oh, now I'm thinking I can hear my sister-in-law. Yesterday, I thought I was leaving my body. I was, you know, I had no idea how to even process all this information. Yeah. And then, you know, my mother-in-law gave me the, the book, um, Life After Life. And then I started understanding I had a near-death experience. And then the, I would say the second big uh, person that came through was a year later. Um, it was between the two near-death experiences. And in the middle of the night, I wake up. And I know that my uncle is again uh, right in front of me, up in the up in the ceiling level again. And he said he's he's passing on to the other side, and he just came to, you know, let me know that he had passed on. And he had lung cancer, I believe he was in his early sixties, and it was something he had been struggling with for a while. But I had no idea if he was close to death or anything like that. Uh, nobody had told me. And so I knew that he passed, came by to say goodbye. And then I expected my mom to call me from Sweden the next day because it was her brother. And she didn't call. And I thought it was so strange. And I waited the next day. Um, you know, so this was in like early Monday morning. She didn't call Monday. She didn't call Tuesday. Finally, on Wednesday, she calls. And she's, you know, saying, oh, how are things going? How are the kids? Blah, blah, blah. And then she said, I have something sad to share with you. And I said, I know, mom, your brother passed away two days ago on Monday. And it was just dead silence. <laughs> and she said, yeah. how did you know? And I said, he was here. And so it started right away. And it, it, I think in the beginning, it was, you know, the relatives that came through, um, to, to teach me that, you know, you can, you can hear us now, you can, uh, communicate with us, but it took, a, took me years before, um, before I actually trusted it. So I would get messages about the family, you know, somebody's sick, somebody's dying, somebody, uh, you're going to be in a car accident. Um, I saw my kids um, remote viewing that they were almost in an accident. All these things were happening over a period of 12 years. Yeah. And so after 12 years, I'm a slow learner that way because I was such a, I was such a non-believer, right? So it took me so long to trust and I would have to write down in a book 
because I would say, oh, it's just a deja vu. It's, it, it, it can't be. And so I started writing things down or I would tell my kids about different things. And that's how I learned to trust it. I said, okay, no, this is, this is real. This is actually happening. Uh, and after 12 years of that, I got the message that I had to go to med school and be a doctor. Uh, and there were other things I was going to do, not just work as a doctor, and but they were going to just tell me later. And I had to write two books, no wait, three. And I was to combine something like the East and West, which I interpreted to be old and new. Yeah. So, but at that point, I, I trusted in that message blindly. And that message of writing two books, no wait, three, I have gotten that message four times from mediums, twice at Arthur Finley College uh, in England from my teachers saying, oh, your mother is here. And she says, you're writing a book. Of course, nobody knew. And she says, oh, no, wait, you're to write two books. No, wait, three. And they, the message is always exactly the same as the original message I got. So a lot of confirmations along the way that I needed in order to trust in that in that path and in that journey and then to develop as a medium and medical intuitive because I was such an, a non-believer from the start. It took, it took a long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that process is a difficult one. And not always, especially coming from someone who had didn't have that belief system. Well, I was quite lucky. I was surrounded by people that my next door neighbor was a medium. So there was a little bit of a trickle into my psyche, I guess, growing up. But uh, Jody's asked a really great question. Hi, Jody. Um, she's just actually, she, can I go back to the last question, Richard? She asked, do you think it's also connected to the pineal gland? Do you think there's something that is triggered with the experiences that we have? Now, obviously, being a medical doctor, would again, you've got this push-pull all the time. Do my experiences connect? There you go. Is it something to do with the pineal glands, she's asked? Yeah, so it's not an experience that we make in the brain. And we. I know that the scientific research has already proven that it isn't something that happens in the brain. So for people who are familiar with Eben Alexander, uh, he was a brain surgeon at Harvard. Yeah. And yeah. he uh, fell into a coma. He had, uh, yes. I think, E. coli meningitis. Yes. And oh, they were he's, monitoring him. He's All right. There's no brain story. activity. Yeah. All right. Amazing yeah. story. Uh, there amazing is no brain story. activity. Yeah. And so we know that it, it that those experiences don't originate in the brain. It originates outside. And we also know consciousness. You no know, consciousness. I the way I look at it, the brain is just the uh, the hardware that um, interprets the messages that we get from the the realm outside of us, yeah. that, you know, yeah. and so consciousness, I would say, resides outside of the human body. We yeah. access that in the in the field and then our brain interprets the messages. Yeah. yeah. But that's oh, why yeah. you would have it can have experiences because that consciousness is still there. And also we know from uh, working as a medium that the spirit world is absolutely alive and well. Yeah. And they oh, are absolutely. aware Oh, what's going on in our daily lives? Uh, and they would know that if if it was if you're just tuning into the energy of a spirit that was from the past, you wouldn't also get what's happening now. Yeah. So yeah, because that's an interesting concept where a lot of mediums don't pick up on where, and I believe it was somebody I interviewed last week that said, uh, but it, it was it was Janet Parker. Hello, Janet, if you're listening, she said, "Do you remember in the spirit world they have lives too?" they have futures too which is again it's a concept because we're so programmed with you know passing into the spirit world that's that's it it's final you know we're all kind of driven into those that belief system um and oh uh, sheena's put sheena's put that's amazing thank you sheena there was a question before that richard i'm not being i'm not quick enough tonight pauline hello pauline she's put like an electrical energy she's asked yeah potentially um rachel roberts hi rachel do you have any thoughts on why you experience this Great absolutely question. yeah it's my life it's my life path my life journey um i've been told that my near-death experiences are in my astrological chart and that there are certain patterns that those people have in their chart i was also told that i probably had more near-death experiences but i actually don't remember them which wouldn't surprise me because i was so sick at the time and i always felt like i was in and out of the body but the experience that i had i would say it was part of my journey i incarnated to have that journey i incarnated to be sick 
uh, you know, took a good six years before I could even uh, go take my kids to a museum or do anything like that. Yeah. And that was still a struggle after six years. And it wasn't until, and then I had another six years where I figured I was never going to be normal again. And uh, this was just, this might be as good as it gets. And so that healing journey was a 12 year journey. But did I incarnate for it? Absolutely. Because I wouldn't be the person I am today. And it's yeah. through the struggles that our soul grows. And, you know, we bring these, I call them the seeds, the things that we learn in yeah. each life. Yeah. Those are the seeds that we bring with us in our little seed bag for our next incarnation. Yeah. And all those things that we learned in those past lives, we bring with us into the next life. Yeah. And so I always say, you know, I'm going to resolve as many issues as I can in this life because I'm not, I don't want to do this one over it was so much work. <laughs> I want to have a different life. And I guess for me, um, I used to, my, my father was very cynical and didn't believe, um, even though he had, uh, we found out later in life, he had his own experiences and we all do, but it, but, because, but, but I guess our programming, et cetera. But from you, your experience is more real. It's more, uh, I don't want to say construct is the wrong word, legitimacy maybe, because you've had, you've come from this position, you've had this experience, and now you're connecting with spirit. If someone is looking for evidence, or someone is looking for an understanding of what is actually going on here, so many people doubt mediums. So many people, and, and they've obviously got an absolute right to do so. But to come from this position that you've come from and having that experience, you're also in quite a unique position to go on and help more people. And, and I, I find it so impressive. Millie's put, this is so interesting when you pass on messages. Is there a limit to what you will share? That's interesting. So are you aware of more? Do you have to filter that? Dr. Lottie, or is that just something you give what you get? Uh, when you're working as a medium? Yeah. 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 Whatever message is coming through, that's what I'm supposed to deliver yeah. to the to the client. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know how it is. It's um, whatever comes through, that's that's what it is. Yeah. It's not necessarily what the, the client wants, right? It's the person that comes through is the person that's going to give you the message. Yeah. Yeah, thank mm. you for that. Yeah, absolutely. But then at the age of 54, you went on to medical school, medical school, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, because that's what the spirit world told me I had to do. And so wow. I literally, <laughs> I literally signed up. I had been on my computer and I was thinking, well, my kids are teenagers now. And, you know, I want to go back to the workforce. But I had been in tech. I was a programming systems analyst for IBM in my youth. And with all this healing journey, and I was always drawn to be a healer ever since I was a little kid, because my dad was okay. a physician. So I always played, you know, doctor and nurse as a child. And I always, um, I always cared about people. I would see, you know, the old man at the grocery store with a cane, and I would wonder, I wonder why he has, why he's limping, you know, wonder what happened to him, and if I could help him. So that was in me, but then getting married and moving to the United States, uh, it was just so daunting to think of studying the science because yeah. the language barrier was so great. I was walking around with a dictionary under my arm for my first year or two and having to study the sciences in, in, in a foreign language. So I went with a business major in computer science because that was just easier to understand more common language. Yeah. And then, of course, my journey you know, <laughs> took me to, but I think it's, it was supposed to be that way too because yeah. all the things that you learn along the way has a reason. But I know I incarnate now. I understand I incarnated to be a healer. Yeah. I know it's my in my numerology chart and all that. You know, I'm here as a healer. And that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to help other people. But it's not just the physical, right? Because yeah. when you look at Western medicine... Um, we are really good at suppressing symptoms with different kind of pharmaceuticals, which is wonderful if you're in pain or, or things like that. But we, most times we don't heal the person. We control the high cholesterol. We control the heart rate. We control the digestive issues. We control the pain. Um, but we don't heal it. And in order to heal, you really have to incorporate the emotional uh, part of you and the spiritual part of you which then led me to, it was actually through a mediumship reading that I ended up in ancestral healing. 
um, because I did, I did, um, I did like three or four readings in a row, and every each reading was it was the exact same pattern. Oh, uh, you know, I have a female client in front of me, probably like fifties. It was it was like a, the same reading three three or four times over, and I said, oh. You know, I have your father here, but oh, I have your grandmother here. Your grandmother, she, she had a really hard life. Her, your grandfather was abusing her. He was physically abusive. And I see, I, she had three kids and I, one of those kids was your mom. But then I see your mom, I see her with your dad. But your dad was abusive because I see him hurting you as a child. And so it was this abusive, uh, physical Passing. abuse passed down. Yeah. And so from the grandfather and then the mother mayor is the same kind of husband yeah. that she had as a father. Yeah. And it just kept trickling down. And I had three of three or four of them in a row. It wow. was to the point when am I talking to the same spirit that just does yesterday? And I'm like, no, I'm not. This is a different person because it was it was it was almost stopped me in my tracks because I heard myself say read it, do the same reading over. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I said, OK, what's with this pattern? And then um I had read the book by Mark Wallin, um, It Didn't Start With You, and I had tried uh, to attend his seminar, but I was always alone in the clinic. It was after I was in my residency, so I could. it was always a time conflict, and here we are in the pandemic, and he was offering this class for physicians and counselors across the globe. I think we were like 200 people with 17 teaching assistants. I mean, it was this huge class, and we ha we learned how to... Uh, you know, see this pattern and the yeah. different patterns that come about and the birth order in your family and and how do you take this apart? So it became this, um, you know, ancestral healing is a pattern that's repeating within the family, typically. Yeah. And it, it it could be a physical issue. You could have a physical disease. You could have OCD, anxiety, uh, emotional issues. It could be almost anything. And it's a matter of, understanding where it's coming from because now yes. again this is what ties in with the near-death experience we are all connected and yeah. i couldn't i couldn't agree more because you see how how connected we are to our ancestors yeah. and it could come from your grandfather and you might not even ever have met the grandfather doesn't matter yeah. because you are entangled in that because you're you maybe you met your grandma or you met your parents because you came from your parents they know the grandparents and you are entangled with that and um the people that got the nobel prize in physics last year literally proved that the quantum entanglement you know once yes, two things so I've heard eat, of the right? of that. yeah the yep. quantum entanglement theory yes yeah, yeah. That we are entangled and that is exactly what i was told in my you know we are all connected to each other and then we're connected up and out and I couldn't agree more because that's what I work with today is that interconnected net. And it's, I tell people, it's like yeah. a big spider web and we're all yeah. on the spider web and everybody you ever met and all the other people as well, we are all connected on this yeah. earth. And we just makes it so silly that we're all arguing with each other because we're uh, all actually all connected. But, so, there, there, but in my experience, there is this level of, of, of so many messages are about the healing about understanding what their path is but they they normally touch on an aspect of their experiences from them where they want to say sorry they didn't have the best relationship with them and i find that a lot so so i hope people can understand the concept of ancestral healing because it is an interesting process that or or a phenomenon i should say that actually happens through people's patterns um, Sheen has just put on a really great, well, I wouldn't say a great comment, but she's, I'm sorry to say, Sheen, my friend kept having a dream that she sees a tunnel and she's trying to do that. I said to her, so I'm just trying to read text type, Dr. Lottie, and they get a bit confused. So my text typing is bad as well. So I'm sorry, Sheena, if I'm messing this up. Uh, I said to her to don't go there. The following week, she passed away in what that tunnel in that tunnel theory which is really sad I, i'm hopefully i've explained that properly but but yeah so and, and I, I remember a lady for a friend of mine uh an older lady said that she had a dream that she was to pass in seven days from her husband and she was to get all her will together and all everything done before the seven days she had an aneurysm a week later died on the spot mm -hmm. 
that's pretty yeah. amazing Spirit, yeah it, you know this life life itself is such an amazing concept that we're completely entangled in that we don't see the wood for the trees right no exactly <laughs> i mean that happens people who work with the death and the dying they know that and yeah. they often have these experiences where they leave the body and then they're told yeah. oh it's not your time yet you got to put your papers together yeah right and they we are so guided by the spirit world if we just stop and listen and tune into that, everybody has a spirit guide. Everybody can connect to some degree with the spirit world because we are spiritual creatures. Yeah. We are just this energy bundle, right? That is in physical form or our soul is living in this physical form to have this experience. Yeah. Um, but it's not until you, you know, pass on. And my dad, who was you know, the complete atheist and didn't believe he, he had such a hard time. He's like, no, it can't happen. You know, you can't be outside your body like that. And my mom would say, no, listen to her. I mean, what if it's true or, you know, yeah. and then when I was at Arthur Finley college, my first time there, my teacher said, Oh, your dad is here. Um, and he's popping in and he said, and he's saying, you proved me wrong. And he's laughing. I was like, yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> so because I, he was referencing to the fact that, you know, yeah, you do go on. Yes, you do. And then my mom came through and my mom would always say when I was a child, well, you know, I hope I'm not just going to sit around on a cloud when when I die. <laughs> and that was hard. Like she always used that as a joke. And also at Arthur Finley College, that's what came through. And she said, oh, your mom beautiful. says, your mom says she's not just sitting around on a cloud. And so, you know, with there's sometimes the evidence that comes through is so spot on that you cannot make it up, right? Where is that information coming from? The yep. spirit world is alive and well on yes. the other side, and they are all in, I would say they're all in heaven. There's, I've never had anyone come from hell, and neither did anybody I've interviewed. No, absolutely. <laughs> right? They, there's more, it's forgiving, yeah. like you said. Yeah. It's all about uh, forgiving and sending love and healing so that the person who's still in this realm um, can, you know, heal that. Yeah. Which yeah. then or in turn heals them because we're connected to them. So when we do ancestral healing, when I work with people in ancestral healing, at the end of that session, I always do a, a, a meditation uh, where, you know, we both close our eyes and then I do... I studied trans healing also at Arthur Finley College. So it's become this, and I've studied shamanism. So it, it, it's become wow. this trans healing shamanic soul journey. It's all, it's all just been integrated. Up, uh, and the connectivity that we have with setting intentions, the quantum physics, yeah. it is all about that because we are such magical creatures. And if we could just see um, what that is and, um, you know, who's just... Um, uh, I was talking to um, Gordon Smith, medium yes. in Scotland, yes. right? I'm just interviewing yeah. him. It's, it hasn't aired yet. Uh, but he had such a good analogy. And he said, you know, it's like you're in the chrysalis, but then the butterfly comes out and Absolutely. the butterfly flies and sees yeah. everything. And it was, I told him, it was the best analogy for having a near-death experience because yeah. that's exactly how I feel. We're just stuck. In this little body, it's like being in a little box. But once we leave the body, it's like we see and feel and hear yeah. all this magnificent world and this yeah. world that is outside. That, but we we are stuck in this little body with this little minuscule brain that's trying to interpret things. And we think we are separate. We have an illusion of being separate from other people and separate from the spirit world. But we're not separate. We're all one. We're all connected. Everything we are, you know, connected to the animals, the, the the planets, the stars, the clouds, the trees, and to each other. We are, it's all one. And when you look at your body, if you were one cell in your body, that one little cell out of your trillion cells says, oh, I'm so efficient. I am, I am just by myself, right? That one little cell. But when you're looking at all the people, all the animals and everything on earth, if that's just the body of the earth itself, we are just that one little cell, just like yeah. you have all these different organs and cells and things in your body, right? It We don't think about that, but we're just that for the earth. We're yeah. just that one cell for the earth. And that's why we're all together. But when you think of the 
uh, all the arguments and wars and things that are going on. It's almost like the war we have within our bodies of disease and illness and viruses and bacteria. That is also what's playing out on the earth realm. We yes. all have Absolutely. disagreements Do- and fights, right? Dr. Lotti, I've got still got... Uh, a few questions I'd like to ask you. But before we go on, I also I was going to say, can we go to a commercial break, Richard? Because I also want to talk about what you've done and what, how you're helping people now and what that means. But we've also got a great question from Tanita. I'd like to talk about the reincarnation aspect as well. So we're just going to take a short break, everyone. Don't go anywhere. Get a cup of tea. Come straight back. We'd love to see you here. Join us at the Bognor Regis Spiritualist Center for a captivating mediumship demonstration on Saturday the 11th November from 7.30 p.m. Experience an evening of connection with the spiritual realms featuring the talents of Bill Hughes, David Hale and Caroline Johnson. For more information and to book tickets please visit bognorspiritualistcenter.co.uk The SPTV Divine Guidance Oracle Pack, a unique blend of inspiration and artistic beauty. Our captivating set of 78 cards combines the power of ancient archetypes, celestial guidance, and the essence of life itself to provide you with a unique tool for self-discovery, clarity, and transformation, all lovingly housed within an exclusive rigid box. The pack includes a booklet that delves into every card in detail, some of which carry dual meanings for deeper interpretation. The booklet also features eight distinctive card spread layouts. Among these treasures, you'll discover 22 major arcana, nine main archangels, four elements, and 40 life cards, each a work of art, radiating beauty and delivering profound messages that resonate deeply within your being. The SPTV Divine Guidance Pack, where beauty meets enlightenment, Pre-order today and unlock the extraordinary wisdom that awaits you. To be among the pioneers in experiencing our forthcoming collection and to reserve your pack in advance, as well as to access more details, including a sample audio description, kindly visit sptv.uk forward slash cards. Nadija Bajami, a proficient strategic hypnotherapist, mind coach, grief educator, accomplished Reiki master, and gifted psychic medium, extends a warm invitation to join us on an exploration during a four-week introductory mediumship course. As a special privilege, this extraordinary opportunity is being offered to our esteemed VIP members without any associated costs. Immerse yourself in the art of refining your innate talents and finding balance in communion with the realm of spirits. The course begins on Sunday, November 5th, at 7 p.m., via Zoom, and details will be placed in the VIP lounge. For more information on becoming a VIP, visit sptv.uk. Tonight from 8 p.m., Bill Hughes and his guest will be demonstrating their mediumship abilities with free readings to our viewers. Join Debbie Romero and guests tomorrow from 6 p.m., offering spiritual guidance, support and readings. Maria and Lee, from the Spiritual Guidance Center will be here on Spiritual Psychics TV, live tomorrow from 8 p.m. Hello everyone and welcome back to Spiritual and Psychic TV. Or was it Psychic and Spiritual? I'm terrible. Anyway. We are here. We are live. It is seven o'clock. It's Thursday evening. We have the most amazing guest in the world, Dr. Lottie Valentine. And I say that because she has done so much to help people. And I want to touch on that. But we have a great question here from Tanita. Lottie, what's your opinion about reincarnation and spirit? How do we still connect with them if they reincarnate? That's a, that is a question I get asked so much. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Yes. Um, I have two thoughts on that. One is that you don't reincarnate until the people that you know in this realm are also in the spirit world. And so they stay there until 
you know, it's only a generation or two, right? Yeah. And you know, already yeah. don't know who who they are. Um, and if they, let's say, is your great is your great grandfather? You knew him, like I knew my great grandfather. He didn't pass away until I was nine. Yeah. And so, did he reincarnate? Maybe, and he's just not coming through anymore for messages. Is my my grandma, and grandpa, and my parents, other people, right? Yeah. So it could be that we just wait it out. Uh, and then say, okay, well, nobody's going to contact me now. I mean, they know also everything on the other side. So, and, but also, I've heard other people that had near-death experiences say um, that, you know, we can still reincarnate because it's all fragments. And they talk about the, the different fragments. You can have a fragment yeah. in the spirit world. You can you can have more than one life on Earth simultaneously yeah. uh, as that soul has like two fragments. So I'm not terribly familiar about that, but that's what I've heard. So that's also another theory that's possible. There's a fairly modern concept of the twin flame aspect, being twin flames being the spark of the same soul. I'm not sure if I buy into that. I'm not sure, but it's a very <laughs> interesting concept. And it, and and again, um, I remember listening to a very interesting story about a very well known actor called Brian Blessed, whose brother died, and the Dalai Lama told him that his son uh, sorry his a brother would reincarnate very quickly so coming from the Dalai Lama I thought that was very interesting and interestingly enough like you said my my own grandmother on my father's side never comes through she passed away in the 80s I've never heard yeah. from her ever <laughs> yeah. she's probably right? out there so, somewhere yeah. she's probably right? having champagne down in the south of France <laughs> Uh, looking at all the fit men sorry ladies but yeah yeah um and why not so who knows who knows but as far as we are uh, you're in your understanding it's an interesting concept isn't it that we we that i'm not sure if we we know truly but but i get a feeling that like you said my dad's uh, i've had communication with my father and he says he's sticking around waiting for us all so when you said that i kind of get that feeling as well so very interesting yeah, and they're now, definitely busy they're learning yeah. stuff and they on the other side absolutely absolutely and but i want to touch on some of the aspects and things that you you're doing now since you've had this experience and you've gone to medical school you do so much you have your own podcast and that's going really well because you mentioned you interviewed gordon smith on your podcast can we give that a plug What's it called? Oh, uh, it comes out uh, November 11th. Okay. And your podcast is called? Dr. Lottie, Science with Soul. P please, everybody, have a check that out. I've been checking it out all week. I've been listening to some of your interviews on there. They're fantastic. So go to that, guys. Check that out. It's really interesting. But one of the things you offer on your website is ancestral uh, uh, mother wound healing or wounds, wounds or wound yep. healing. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yes, so ancestral healing. So the mother wound is one kind of wound. Um, and also I'm a collaborator with Hemisync. So if you go to my website and click on Hemisync, um, you can also get a CD or a download, which is a two hour um, journey of how to, how to untangle that for yourself. And do the work yourself or you can you know schedule a session with me as well and we just released another one um last month uh which is called the relationship wounds and they're they're entangled so there's different ways that we deal with with the wounds and how they then show up in our life and a mother wound is very common and so that's the one i developed first and that was released a year ago because when you look at the mother, so I, when I learned this, when I studied ancestor healing, I said, oh, today we're going to do the mother wound. I don't have a mother wound. My mom was great. I love my mom. My mom was at home until I was 12 years old and she worked part time. She was a very loving uh, person, would, you know, always make cookies and cinnamon rolls and nurture you. I mean, I, yeah. really no complaints. And then I sat through these lectures on mother wound. I said, you know what? I see now that I think everybody has a mother wound because even if you have a good mother and mother that you love, there's still things, I mean, that you're not going to, there's still needs that are not going to be met yeah. or you're uh, taught to do certain things. So I was born 1958. So that means I grew up in the 1960s in Sweden. And back then, um, 
it was, you know, more children should be seen and not heard. Yeah. Uh, you're a little girl. You help with the dishes. You help clean up. Uh, you know, you, you wear dresses for the parties. And I know this is all these little rules, right? And you don't speak back to your mother. You don't swear. You don't show your anger. You you behave in a certain way to be the good little girl that then grows up to then be the caretaker of your own family, children, and your husband. And that was pretty much how I was raised in the 1960s. And when you were raised that way, right, you, so that is a mother wound in itself because you are taught to not speak back. You're, not, you're taught not to show your emotions. You're taught to um, just help everybody else all the time and put your needs last. Well, as an adult, that's going to translate into other issues. Now you're in the relationship with your husband and you feel like you're not being seen, you're not being heard uh, because you were raised that way. You were raised to be the caretaker of everyone else. And so things show up later in life, um, regardless whether you had a good mother or a mother that wasn't yeah. there. But yeah. there are certain things that, you know, if you had a mother that was cold and distant or maybe had a, some drug uh, use, you yeah. definitely weren't seen and heard at all. And you were walking on eggshells, uh, probably, yeah. you know. And then that causes certain types of issues later on in life. And many times we invite those this, that dysfunction, which is what happened when I did those mediumship readings everybody had invited back that that man that was the abusive alcoholic type of personality is because whatever yeah. we reject uh, also gets invited back because it's an unresolved energy now so we get stuck I, I call it the energy loops we get stuck in these energy loops where things repeat so the uh, I, I developed a mother wound and I developed a relationship wound but when I work with people if people sign up for a session with me for ancestral healing, they get 13 questions emailed to them that says, what is the, your problem that you're facing? When did it start? Did anything happen before this started? And sometimes it didn't and, and they're just completely unaware and they, you know, they fill out the questions they have answers for and leave the rest blank. And then when I see them, uh, you know, I will ask them different kinds of questions yeah. depending on birth order and whatever it is that they tell me. But I'm also guided by spirit, right? I cannot get rid of spirit at this point. Yeah. It is part of my life and how I work. And I've had, I've had, I've worked with people that say I have very few memories from the age before the age of 12, because my household was so abusive, yeah. and the spirit world in those cases have showed up and filled in the blanks and I said I see this I see that I see um, there's a refrigerator with no food and there's all these bottles I see men sitting on a sofa yeah those are my brothers blah 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 and it feels and so the spirit world will step in and help so it's a it's a really magical um, kind of work or ex experience for myself at this point because I feel so blessed that I'm able to help all these different people and create that yeah. healing yeah. And then at the end, we always we always do a healing and we send healing to the spirit world and to our ancestors, as well as forward in time and to our offspring and our own children and anybody that comes after us. Yeah. But when you look at quantum physics and that those Nobel Prize winners, we are all entangled with everything that is. And so yeah. when we can recognize where the issues are coming from, we can also create healing for that. And we can then restore the harmony in the universe itself. Yeah, yeah. That's beautifully explained. Um, sit, hi, Cindy. Uh, she's asked a question. Dr. Lottie, I have been told I'm an old soul. How would you explain what the meaning of this is, please? So, I mean, I see that with people when I work with people. I sometimes say you're an old soul um, because there is, a, I don't know what it is that I'm, I'm actually reading because I just get this knowing about people or... Uh, even knowing things about their current life that yeah. I shouldn't know, right? But you're a medium, so you, I'm sure you get the same. You just know things about people. Even when I see a photograph, sometimes yeah. um, I can say, uh, you know, who this person was. Um, and so when you say you're an old soul, it just means you've been here many, many times before, yeah. right? So you have a lot of you have a lot of seeds in your seed bag. You have a lot of experiences in your past lives that you're carried with you into this life. And so you have a more um, diverse or mature look at the different problems or issues you're facing because yeah. you have all that experience to draw on that is not even from this lifetime, but it, you just know that this is the way to go or we should not react with anger right now. Let's have everybody express yeah. their feelings. 
right? Is that you have a different approach because you've already lived through those other yes. states yeah. of existence. Those experiences. Yeah, yeah, beautifully explained. I notice that within children sometimes, uh, you know, they can be young and playing and be a toddler, two or three. You just feel that knowing that they're an old yeah. soul. And it's interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure whether that translates in their play. I'm not sure um but yeah very interesting thank you cindy for that just coming back to the ancestral healing so i know you said you've got kind of a self-help aspect on your website as well where people could look at that themselves um is that a drawn out process is that something um people can do at home because there'll be some people that will be interested that want to dip their toe in first if that makes yeah. sense yeah, absolutely. So um, both of those, uh, the mother wound and the relationship wound, are four tracks. Each track is uh, about 30 minutes long, like 32 minutes or 33 minutes long. And it actually, it, the first track, I explain, you just listen. And so you create that awareness. Oh, that's how I got that wound. And because once you um, take that apart and you see, where it's coming from. So I give you different examples yeah. of how these different things show up in your life. And then a uh, second track, I think it is, we go into, okay, what issues do you have now? And then there's worksheets. You actually can download the worksheets if you do the MP3 and you fill out the worksheet for yourself. And then you go on, you know, all these different meditations along the way. And then we go on one, um, it's like a shamanic journey, um, where people are helped, they meet their spirit guides or spirit animals and ask them for their help. So I guide you on this meditation and it's all with music in the background. It's just beautiful. And that helps uh, bring those me you know, messages or memories back uh, of where this particular issue is coming from. And then in the last track, they do the healing. And so they go on, a, again, on a shamanic journey, soul journey, yeah. where they create healing and it, it's all guided and you know, I, I show them, I take them through this. This is like a two hour process and you could do half an hour a day, right? Because it's a lot of, um, I mean, I know people, you know, say, you oh, know, I did the, the mother wound. I did the first track, then I cried. Then I did the second track, then I cried again. And then by the time I did the fourth track, I cried again. But now I feel so relieved because they also have sent healing to the wounds that they carry within you. Because a lot of these things are subconscious but when we carry these uh, traumatic events or hurts inside of us, that also gets stored in our tissues. And yeah. we know that certain certain uh, emotions and the way we deal with life itself creates certain types of diseases. So we become more disease prone. And the more we can learn to work through our emotions and just live our life and be and be free and loving and the more yeah. work we do which is always the hardest it's yeah. really hard to do the work on yourself that's the last one you want to do you'd rather yeah. change everybody else right Absolutely. the, the self-work is is harder but once we go through that and we release it we allow ourselves to cry we allow ourselves to show yeah. our feelings we write it down we recognize where it's coming from but once you see it you can also release it yeah that's the beauty of that We've not even touched on your shamanic aspect of what could you do. Um, but I want to come back to, if you don't mind, the comment you said earlier. We've also got a comment here from Alison. Alison, I promise we'll come back to that question because it's a great question. So um, I want to come back to the fact that you went to medical school at 54 and you said because spirit told you. Did you double check? Because that's the first thing I would say, because that's not some big, that's not kind of, you know, oh yeah, a walk in a park. That takes commitment, hard work and dedication. Mm -hmm. And you've done that. So first of all, congratulations. <laughs> but mm -hmm. why do you think that was? Did Spirit ever explain why you became a doctor? Yes, they said I had to be a doctor for the work that I was here to do. Uh, but it wasn't just going to be working as a doctor, it was going to be these other things. And I said, what do you mean other things? Yeah. And they just said, when the time is right, we'll tell you. Just focus on your studies. And then I did all the prereqs, right, not knowing if they were even going to accept somebody in my age group. And I just said, no, I'm just, at this point, I just blindly trusted it because so many messages over 12 years. And I said, no, this mm -hmm. is what they want me to do. And I just went with it. And then when I got to med school, I was like, okay, I'm here. Like, what's next? And for four years, I got the same message. It didn't matter how much I meditated and asked for guidance. The message was just finish your degree, focus on your studies, finish your degree. 
And then as soon as I graduated, I graduated in June of 2016, took my boards in August of 2016. It's like three days of, of medical boards. And then you don't know if you pass. You have to wait until the first week of October because it is a national test all over the United States. And they have to make sure that they're correcting it exactly the same. Sometimes they'll throw out a question because they realize you know, half the people said one answer and the other half said another answer and it could be okay. interpreted in two different ways, right? Yeah. So they got to make sure they do the same thing for all the students across the United States. Yeah. So it takes a long time. And during that time, I was working in the clinic, uh, just helping out basically, because you can't really work as a doctor because you don't have a license yeah. yet. Yeah. And yeah. I studied craniosacral therapy and I met this woman and I was actually flew to San Francisco to do the class. And this woman said, oh, you know, I'm from Scottsdale, Arizona. And I said, wow, you know, I'm from Prescott, Arizona. I was living up in the mountains at the time from my residency. And we never got to work with each other. So that's all I knew about this woman. And then I said, all right, I'm coming down uh, like two weeks from now to do a seminar down in Phoenix. So let's, let's meet for dinner. So we meet for dinner. And I don't know anything about the, this woman. And she doesn't know anything about me, except that we both live in Arizona. So we're sitting at the bar waiting for our dinner table. And she says, uh, oh, um, somebody's here that wants to give you messages. Are you open to receive messages? And I said, sure. And I was just kind of giggling at this point. I was like, there is no way this woman is going to get anything right about me. She doesn't know anything about me. She can't even guess it. I grew up in Sweden. My life is so different from anybody else living in Arizona. Right? Just no idea who I am. So I said, sure, bring it in. And I was just kind of, you know, almost like, she's not going to get anything right. Sure enough, it was my mother. She talks about, you know, rowing in the boat, laying the fishnets in the ocean. I was like, oh, my God, it really is my mom. And she knew these, you know, things about me that she just could not even have guessed. And then she says, your mom says you have to go to Arthur Findlay College and study mediumship. Wow. And I said, I can't do that. I just graduated. I just took my boards. I don't, I don't even have my license yet. I don't even know if I passed my boards. And she kept at it. And she kept talking about well, you were doing all this management training when you were working for IBM and blah, blah, blah. She knew everything about me. And finally, after the third time, she said, your mom says you have to go to Arthur Finley College. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm not making any money yet. And, you know, how am I supposed to get all the money to do that? And finally, after the third time, I said, okay, fine, fine. I will go to Arthur Finley College. I don't know how I'm going to do it yet, but I'll go. Six months later, I was at Arthur Finley College. And that's how wow. that whole journey began uh, with studying mediumship. And I was actually quite, I did not believe, I wasn't, I didn't believe yet that you could actually bring in somebody from the spirit world for somebody else. Because that was really the first time I had re received a message from somebody else who didn't yeah. know me, right? Yeah. And so I was very skeptical about it. And I, I arrived a day early and I sat in the hotel and my mom had passed away my first year in med school. Uh, and she had like Alzheimer's at the end, dementia. She was like 87. And I was th sitting in this room and I was trying to think what to do because I was just trying to get on the right time schedule. And I watched these episodes of brain teaser or brain games or something on it was like on netflix and i think and i watched you know three or four of these hour-long episodes got nothing else to do and then i get to I had my first reading at arthur findlay college uh, by my teacher and she said your mother is here and one of the messages was you're writing a book and you're you're to write two books no wait three so that was one message and that was my own message right and then she says, your mother tells me that you have been watching all these brain TV games because you're worried you're going to get dementia just like she had. And I was just, you know, I was just so amazed. Like she knew what I had been doing a few days earlier. And then she said, your mom says, don't worry, you're not going to die of dementia. You're going to die from something else. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> at that point. And that's what I tell my patients now. I said, you know, we worry about the things that we're going to die from cancer or from the yeah. heart disease that your parents yeah. had. But the truth is, I mean, you could die from a bee sting, allergic reaction in a restaurant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, we, the things that we don't think about. So I tell people, don't don't worry about how you're going to die or yeah. what you're going to get. Yeah. Just enjoy your life. Absolutely. Absolutely.
Um, so you've been to the Alpha Finley College. Fantastic place. Yes, several times. Alison's asked a great question. Excuse my voice, it's going a little bit. How do we get to know our spirit guides and animals, please? Did you have the inside track, Dr. Lottie, on your guides? You kind of met them. Right, right. So, yeah. So, I mean, the guides came through very early on. Yeah. Uh, I knew that I had a guide and I didn't know who it was yeah. in the beginning. Um, and I'd say, you know, we all have guides and I work with that. Now I draw people's guides because I see them. They come like uh, as flashes. Um, and I do a quick sketch in uh, typically it takes six or seven minutes. Then I'll see the spirit guide on the paper. But then that spirit guide has then this uh, is the client's guide uh, and they have messages and it's always spot on. It's, it's always spot on what the guide knows about them because they are with that person. It's, and I believe it's the, the main guide that comes in because they're very close. It's almost like a merging of the, the spirit guide and the client. Um, and the, the human is often almost like a reflection of the guide. It's very interesting because the guide has had a life where they're sort of experts in what you're here to learn in this life. Yeah. So, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, also just worth noting and to let people know of, you are an author, but um, you've got a great book out called Med School After Menopause which may help a few people can you explain a little bit about your book and you've also got another great book the journey of the, of my soul which is quite an inspirational story again which we've kind of touched on today yeah so the the book um so it has my near-death experiences in there in detail yeah, yeah. Uh, it has one chapter i think on what it's like to be you know 54 and go to med school and when most people are in their late 20s or early 30s yeah and um and actually, it's, you know, we think that we're too old, but the truth is that the older we get, the wiser we get, and the more life experiences we have that you then draw on. You also need a lot less sleep because you're older. I could yeah. never have done med school when I was in my 20s. I required way too much sleep. Yeah, me too. And <laughs> so it's, it, in a sense, it's, yeah, it, in a sense, it's actually a lot easier um, to go to, uh, to, you know, and if you're going to be, I mean, look at how old we are now what you know most of us might be 100 years old so being 50 you haven't even lived your half adult life yet because you weren't even an adult until you were 20 or 21 yeah. so that's only a third kind of one of your life and so there is a lot more and people work now until 75 80 i have people who are in their 90s that look like they're 75 as patients i mean wow. they're amazing wow. they're still driving they're out there volunteering i mean it's amazing and I look at that, I was like, wow, I got, you know, I might have like 35, 40 years left. And now we're, you know, doing more transplants and all that is going to take off as well. You need a new heart here. Here you go. Yeah. We can grow that wow. for you. Right. And, and so our, is amazing. Yeah. 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 So I look at it as, you know, like, hey, if you're not happy with your life and you're in your 50s, go do something else. Change yeah. it. Yeah. And so the, the book is about you know, helping other people step into their intuitive powers. Uh, I share my journey of all the different, uh, many different examples of them, uh, you know, how I was guided by the spirit world and things that happened to yeah. me to help yeah. people pay attention to those things in their own life yes. and just, you know, tune right into it instead of keep saying, oh, it's just a deja vu. It was just a coincidence uh, because many times it's not. And so it's to help people uh, create their own true life path and find themselves on their own journey yeah and you're clearly very passionate about helping people you've done so much work around this what next for you though we've literally got less than two minutes i'm so sorry <laughs> what's next um uh, i thought well i got the second book sort of brewing in my head but i think it's uh maybe a year or two away and then that will come together and i feel like it's going to come together quickly yeah but it's it, it'll be a you know helping again it's all about helping people it's i'm here as a healer and i i'm aware of that to help uh help other people find their path in life or to create healing uh for them in this life fantastic dr lottie valentin thank you valentine thank you very much for coming on spiritual talk tv and well, being our guest this evening it's been really uplifting and we love hearing people's experiences and how they connect with there's so much more 
in life, isn't there? There's so much more for us to reach for and become, and you're an inspiration. So we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for coming on and sharing this space with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. No problem. Thanks, everybody. Guys, and we'll be back in two weeks where I believe we have the amazing Lisa Williams medium coming in from America as well. So I'm really excited about that as well and hearing about her journey as well into mediumship and much more. So for now, guys, it's time to say goodbye. But don't go anywhere, though. Get yourself a cup of tea because we've got the great Bill Bill Hughes coming on next. OK, at eight o'clock. So, so go and make yourself a cup of tea and come back. Bill's coming back with so much more and uh, yeah, stay tuned. Thanks everybody.